again. So was that not good? Man, I don't know about you, but I'm pumped for God's word today. Randy, I, maybe the Holy Spirit likes the harmonica. I don't know, but like, yes, yes. So, so good to be in worship with you. Excited to open the word. I want to just take a minute and uh, welcome Pastor Dan and Carol Ketchum. So some of you know them, they're visiting with us today. And uh, Pastor Dan and Carol were around here when, uh, when this church came to this property and uh, instrumental in, uh, in helping us be who God has called us to be. So good to have you guys back again. And again, welcome to those of you online. Um, if you got your scriptures today, we're going to be all over the place. So if you didn't know where certain things were, you're going to know today, right? But we'll also have it on the screen for you to follow along. And as I said, I just think God has a word for us today. Um, in, in the scripture. And so uh, we're in this prayer series, so we're going to start together with reading the Lord's Prayer. And so I'll just invite you to join me. It'll be on the screen. So uh, here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be covering a lot today. And, uh, and so I just want you to know that I'm not going to speak to everything that there is to speak to today in, in our message. So just kind of a, a disclaimer as we get started because you're probably going to leave here today and say, man, there was a whole lot more um, that we should have talked about. So I know, right? And, uh, and I didn't want to keep you here for several hours. Neither did our kids' ministry folks. So, um, so we, why do we do a prayer series a couple times a year? You should be able to repeat this whole introduction by now, but it's worth repeating anyways, I think. We do a prayer series at least twice a year because we believe that prayer changes things. Amen? Right? Prayer, but prayer just doesn't change things. Right? Prayer changes me. Right, when I get myself before the Lord, prayer begins to change me. And when we join in together in prayer, guess what happens? Prayer changes us. Right, that we are a community. We are a body. And that we, when we begin to, to pray together, it puts us in a position to hear from God. And not only does it put us in a position to hear from God, it puts us in a position to listen and obey. Right? It's one thing to come to prayer and just give God kind of all our stuff. It's a whole nother thing to listen and obey. And this is really what we're going to dig into in the Lord's Prayer today. Is that, is that you can have this thing memorized. That you can say all these things at 9, noon, and 6 p.m. But if you don't listen and obey, they're just words. They're just words that we say. It was pretty funny this morning, um, right after worship practice, somebody's alarm went off. And it wasn't 9 o'clock, but the alarm went off and all of us were like Pavlov's dog. We just started in on the prayer because we're just so used to this by now. But, and it can easily just become words, right? And so it's super important that we understand that we listen and obey. And I think that's even more important today because prayer has the power to shape your life. 
Prayer has the power to shape your life. And our lives are being shaped by so many things even today. And and even unconsciously, if we're not aware, our lives are being shaped by the world around us. And it's just natural to live in this world and, and have our lives be shaped by other things. And this is why prayer is so important because prayer has the power to shape our life. And the Lord's prayer is a gift for us. It's the gift of a framework for the kind of prayer that specifically shapes us in the way of life in the kingdom of God. It's the kind of prayer that, that, that shapes you in the way of Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is important for us to understand because today is going to be a difficult subject matter. And, and, and I want you to be able to receive it as, as life in the way of the kingdom of God. And so I want to pray just briefly for us as we begin this journey, because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do something for those of us in the room and for those of you watching online. So Jesus, we give ourselves to you today. Holy Spirit, would you search us and know us? God, we give you permission to do your work in us today. Would you speak what is true? In Jesus' name, amen. See, the kingdom way of life is a life of freedom. The kingdom way of life is the way of freedom. It sets you free. Jesus tells us right at the beginning of his ministry, he shows up on the scene. He's about 30 years old and he shows up to the synagogue and he, he pulls out the scroll, right? And he opens it to the prophet Isaiah. And this is what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim what? Freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed what? Free, right? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he's talking about, he's kind of pulling all this New Testament or Old Testament imagery in that we don't have time to go into today about this kind of year of jubilees, right? This year that you are set free. And I want to say that today might be the day of the Lord's favor in your life if you're willing to listen and obey. That, that Jesus comes to set you free today. Paul tells the church in Galatia, the early church, right? They're just getting started. He says this in Galatians 5.1. It is for what? Freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Oh, how easily we allow ourselves to be burdened by a yoke of slavery, by a yoke of sin, which we're going to talk about. Right? And if the kingdom way of life is freedom. And I'm not talking about freedom like, so like Braveheart, like freedom, right? That's not the kind of freedom I'm talking about, right? Sometimes we get confused about what freedom actually means, right? This is a whole nother kind of freedom that only Jesus can bring, that only the Holy Spirit in your life can do because the kingdom way of life is a way of freedom that is unlike any freedom you've experienced in this world, unlike any sort of freedom that a government can give you, right? This is a different kind of freedom. And so what is it? A freedom from what? Well, I think, I think that the Lord's Prayer can really help us with this. And we haven't really dug into it this way, but, but I want to kind of back up a little bit and, and walk through it. But a freedom from what? Well, it's a freedom from identity confusion. Right? And this is why we pray our Father. Right? So that you know who you are. He is our Abba. It's a freedom from being confused, from, from putting your identity in somebody else or in your job or, or whatever it might be that we so often wrap our identities around in. This is freedom from identity confusion because we pray our Father. Right? It's also freedom from measuring up. Right? From, from trying hard to kind of attain to this certain level of acceptance, from, from checking off all the boxes in the list. This is why we pray hallowed be whose name? Your name. Right? God's in that, that God wants to demonstrate his holiness through our lives. It's not about you measuring up. It's about you cooperating with God that he might demonstrate his holiness through your life. It's freedom from measuring up. It's, it's also freedom from idolatry, right? from the idolatry of nationalism and individualism, right? Trusting in the kingdom of this world and in our own will. This is why we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. It's freedom from, from idolizing all these things that give us a brave heart kind of freedom. It's just a, a, a fake kind of freedom. And it's also freedom from materialism and worry. 
right, from, from, from trying to get and, and take care of all that's just ourselves, right? And this is why we pray, give us today our daily bread. Right? God wants to give us freedom. And what we're dealing with today is freedom from relational debt. Right? And this may be a little bit of a, a confusing language and we're going to unpack it by that. And we're going to unpack it through this message. How many of you, and, uh, and you can raise your hand if you're brave enough. Um, those of you online, you know, put up a little hand or, you know, however you want to make that happen, right? How many of you have ever been hurt by someone? Okay, yeah, everybody in the room, right? I'm guessing those of you online. All right, how many, okay, it's going to get even more. How many of you have ever hurt someone? Yeah, okay, we're honest, <laughs> everybody, everybody in the room, right? If you've ever been hurt by someone, right, you know the feeling, whether it's an emotional feeling, whether it's a mental feeling, whether it might be physical, you know the feeling of relational debt. Something has been taken from you. That, 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 that all of a sudden when that hurt happens, there's now a lack, there, there's a deficit in my life. That person owes me. That person owes you and they need to repay me for what they did. Right? And that pain can run really deep because some hurt, some debts can't be repaid. Right? There's some, sometimes there's no replacing that deficit that happened in your life. And so we know the feeling of relational debt. Maybe we've never called it that before. But it's this deficit that happens when we're hurt or when we hurt someone when we hurt someone, we withdraw something that wasn't ours to take. This is relational debt. And the reality of life is people are going to say and do things that will hurt you. And this is true, right? We try to raise our kids to understand this, right? That, that the reality of life is people are going to say and do things that will hurt you. And without God's help, through the Holy Spirit in you, you are going to say and do things that will hurt people. See, the devastation of sin is that given the right circumstances, you and I are capable of really awful things. Right? You may look at somebody else, you may look at a murderer, or you may look at an adulterer and, and kind of get to tisk your tongue out of it. I would never. Right? Given the right circumstances, you are capable of awful things. This is what the scriptures talk about sin. And as I was preparing my message, and I wrestled with this bad boy this week. I've got notes and notes and pages and pages. And I, at one time I was, I was several hours into it and I was digging a tunnel in like original and personal sin. And I was like, nope, no, we like back this train up because we could go a long ways. But the reality of it is, right, is that because of sin, given the right circumstance, you and I are capable of pretty awful things. So we need to pay attention to what God wants to say to us today. So Jesus instructs us to pray. Right? And forgive us our debts, right? those withdrawals that we make from people, those withdrawals that we make from God's love, right? as we also have forgiven our debtors. So right now, and those of you online, I want, I want you to get in your mind both a situation and a person, a debt and a debtor. I want, you, I, want you to get, I want you to get that in your mind. It can be a current one or it can be in the past, right? A situation in which you know you were wrong. Maybe you said something, right? You, you, maybe you did something or maybe you didn't do something you know you should have done and it hurt someone. Or possibly you entertained a thought that would have hurt someone. Or you know in your own heart and mind that what you did or thought, even though nobody else knew about it, it offended God, whose name is holy. A God who is perfect love. You got it? Got that thing and that person? Feels really good, doesn't it? Mm, so good. I'm glad I came to church today. All right? I feel so good about myself. All right, here's what I want you to do. Okay, I want you to take those things, either that's something that you did or so that debt or that debtor, and I want you to hold them in your hands today. And I want you to keep them at the, at the forefront of your heart and your mind as, as we walk through this today. And I, I know it might be a challenge, but I'm just, I'm asking you, I, I, think, I think the Holy Spirit wants to do something with that thing today. I'm going to cover four truths through the scriptures. Here's truth number one of our scripture today. 
we are all debtors. We're all debtors, both in person and in practice. Right? We're, we're, all, we're all in debt. And we cannot pray this prayer of, of forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We cannot pray this request until we realize that we need to pray it. Because we're holding that, that thing that we are debtors. And only when we come to terms that we too are debtors, are we able to more freely release those indebted to us. Right? The power of forgiveness seems to be tied to forgiveness. Right? The power of God's forgiveness in us is directly tied to forgiveness. And so we're instructed to pray and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And, but this request, right? This is like manageable. Like we think about this and it's manageable. And, uh, but, but this request has some foreboding commentary right, that follows the prayer. So we stop, right, at, at, and, and deliver us from the evil one, and then we kind of add on that last part, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, and we stop there. But verses 14 and 15 talk about what we just said in verse 12, and, and it's a little bit unnerving. Here's what it says. For if you forgive, this, remember this is Jesus talking, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but... If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, we got to admit, that's heavy, right? Like, you read that and you're like, ouch. Like, wait, so hold on. So is Jesus, let's be honest, is Jesus saying that forgiveness is conditional? Is he saying that, that forgiveness is conditional on whether, on whether or not I'm willing to forgive? I mean, I thought Christianity, I thought following Jesus was like all about grace. Like this abundant grace like we sang about in, in service. I thought it was just all about like God's free and abundant grace. Didn't the apostle, like this dude that like, we talk about a lot in church, he's an apostle something or other. Didn't he say something about not having to earn forgiveness, about not having to, to earn our salvation? Yeah, you're correct. You're absolutely right. In fact, let's take a look at, at what this apostle guy says. He says this in, in Ephesians 2. He says, For it is by grace, right, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So let's talk about grace just real quick, right? So grace, God's unmerited favor. Right, God's unmerited favor towards you. It's re God refusing to give us what we deserve. Or even clearer, maybe in today's passage, is God refusing to hold our debt against us. This is grace. Like God refusing to hold your debt against you. Why? Well, because of love. Right, because of God's abundant love for us, he pours out his grace on you and me even when we don't deserve it. And then he says, so that no one can boast. And so otherwise he's saying, so that no one can hold anything over anyone else. So that no one, as we'll see in a minute, who has been forgiven, right, no one who, who has been forgiven is justified in withholding forgiveness. This is, this is what, Paul, what Paul is saying. Is that God has poured out his grace into your life so that you can't boast, so that you can't withhold that from somebody else. If you've been forgiven, you are never justified in withholding forgiveness from somebody else. That is boasting. And so Paul is very clear, and I love what C.S. Lewis says. Right? He says, forgiveness is a wonderful idea until we actually have someone to forgive. Right? We love forgiveness, right? You're like, I love God's forgiveness. I love God's grace until I actually have been wounded. Until I actually have to give it. Right? And then, then the idea of forgiveness is like, oh, like, that's going to cost me something. That means I'm going to have to absorb something. So Jesus tells a story. He does this a lot, right, if you know the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a story to illustrate the kingdom reality of freedom through forgiveness. Now, if you know, if you know the scriptures, especially the gospels, right, Jesus tells story after story of what the kingdom of God is like. We did a series on this in the summertime, right, what the kingdom of God is like. He starts off saying the kingdom of God is like, and then he tells a story. He tells what's called a parable. 
Right? But what Jesus does is he tells all these stories and then he shows us what the kingdom of God is like through the cross and the resurrection. He tells all these stories and then he shows us what the kingdom of God is like. So whenever you read these stories of, of this is what the kingdom of God is like, you need to have in your mind a picture of the cross and the resurrection because this is the kingdom. This is how we interpret these stories. So here we go. We're going to read this whole thing. It's called the parable of the unmerciful servant. All right, it's in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. If you have it in your scriptures, we'll have it on the screen as well. All right, then Peter came to Jesus. So Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He's kind of like disciple number one, right? So he's, he's the guy, right? And so he's just always trying to figure stuff out. Gets himself in trouble a lot because he's trying to figure out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So Peter comes to Jesus and asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister? Anybody ever ask God that? How many times, Lord, do I need to forgive this person and Peter like he's kind of getting it right so how many times Lord shall I forgive my brother or sister and he answers his own question you guys ever did that before right you ask a question and then answer it well and then find out you're wrong that's what happens to Peter right up to seven times so Peter's like <laughs> like seven times Lord like I'm pretty good like yeah I do it seven times and Jesus's response Jesus answered I tell you Peter not seven times but 77 times. So does this mean that when you go home today, you've got that person in your mind, right? Still, that thing and that, that person, right? And you, you create a checklist, right? You go home, put it on your fridge. You create 77 boxes, right? It goes all the way down one side of your fridge, all the way down the next, right? And every time you forgive that person, you, like you put one out, like put one out, right? Is this what Jesus means? Don't we wish, right? So in the scriptures and, and the way we understand kind of the thinking of that day is 77 times essentially means like Buzz Lightyear, right? To infinity and beyond, right? This is what Jesus is saying, right? That how many times, Peter? Well, infinity times infinity, Peter. This is, this is what the kingdom is like. And then he tells a story. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, right? This is, this is a picture. So don't... Remember, it's what the kingdom of heaven is like, not what the kingdom of heaven is. Okay, sometimes we read these stories and we take them literally. That messes up the story, right? Because you're going you're gonna to hear things in this parable. You're like, what? Like, that doesn't really match the Jesus. I know the kingdom of heaven is like. So we have to look through the story, right? The cross and the, re the resurrection, okay? Kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And I love this. The king wanted Right, they wanted to settle things up, wanted to make things right, right. So the king wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, right. So anytime Jesus tells a parable, they're usually exaggerated, right. So 10,000 bags of gold, Jesus is basically saying this dude owed a debt he could not repay. There is no way in his lifetime that he is ever going to repay this debt, right? So this is like, again, this is the 70, 70 times 7, right? 10,000 bags of gold, this guy owed a debt. And he was brought to his master. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold in to repay the debt, right? So it's called debtor's prison, Right, so they would have to go and, uh, until they could pay this debt off. Right? But there was a problem here. Right? And so we'll go to the next slide. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. And he says, be patient with me, he begged. And I will pay back everything, which is foolish because there's no way he's ever going to pay it back. Right? Sometimes we do this with God. Right? Like, just be patient with me. I can do this, God. Right? And we kind of buy into this measuring up and this striving. And, and God's like, you're not, not going to happen. You can't. You, you need me. Right? Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay it back. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Imagine how you would feel. Right? Imagine, imagine for a moment that you've been released from this debt that you could have never covered. This is what happened servant releases him from this, this grace. He says, but then the servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and choked him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. A hundred silver coins. This was nothing. This was compared to the 10,000 bags of gold. This was like, you know, it was like coffee change, right? It was, it was nothing. But he refused, verse 30. Instead, he went off 
and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants, I like this part, when the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and went and told the ma- their master everything they had done, or everything that had happened, right? They're like, Christians behaving badly, right? When, they, when we see other Christians, we're like, stop it! Like, stop behaving that way! Right? And this, is, this is what the servants see, this guy. Like, you've received this grace and they're outraged. Like, how? How could you act this way? Verse 32, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Remember this idea of of forgiveness that begets forgiveness, right? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed, which was never, right? He could never pay this back. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Woo! Right? Like, let that sink in for a minute. This is how my heavenly father will treat you if you don't forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. So truth number two. One, we're all debtors. Truth number two. We're instructed to pray and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors because, here it is, unforgiveness will make your life hell. Un- this, is, this is what happens. Right, in the story, right, that the, that the servant was unwilling to forgive even though he'd been forgiven. And guess what happens? His life becomes hell. He's thrown into a debtor's prison of which he will never get out. Remember, look through the story. He's, thro- he, he's thrown into this place. It, unforgiveness will cause you to see everything through the lens of your hurt rather than your freedom. It will cause you to live defensively, being slow to trust and slow to love. It will rob your joy and limit your hope. In the scriptures, hell is not so much a place that we go as much as it is a circumstance that we choose. You need to know today that God doesn't send people to hell. People choose hell. God desires that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of him. But we, in our unforgiveness, choose hell. How? In the parable, the master allows the debtor to bear the weight of his debt. This is the, it's the, the debtor chooses this. I love what author and pastor Rich Velotis from Queens, New York, he says this, and you might have to think about it a minute. In the act of forgiveness, we are granted the inner freedom from allowing the wound inflicted from another to be the primary and permanent point of reference from which we relate to the world. Right? This, this wound that happens to you, this wound that happens to me becomes the lens by which we see the rest of the world. So in other words, I think what Jesus is saying through this parable is that for God's forgiveness to transform us, it must flow through us. Right? Grace begets more grace. For God's forgiveness to transform you, it must flow through you. And this is the riddle, right? This is the riddle of forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is, this is the point where you might say to me, well, Pastor Sean, you, you don't know what they did to me. And we would sit down for coffee, right? And we'd talk about that wound that happened to you how you were taken advantage of, right? You don't know what they did. I can never forgive them for that. Like there's, there's, there is no way, and I want to acknowledge, right? I want to acknowledge that there's some here in the room, some watching online, who were deeply wounded by somebody in, in such a way that it has made their life hell. Right? There's, there's some that are part of our church that they were so deeply wounded that, that it has made their life hell. By no choice of their own. And then there's some of us right, who have deeply wounded somebody. And, and, and that it makes our life hell as well. You see, forgiveness isn't, isn't so much an emotional act. right? It's, it's not so much a, a, an emotional act as it is a consistent daily act of the will. We have to decide. Those of you that have been wounded deeply, you have to decide every day. It is an act of, there is nobody that measures up, 
right, to this. Uh, I'm so emotionally like together with it that I just, you know, it doesn't bother. Those of you that have been wounded so deeply, it is a consistent daily act of the will to forgive. And I just want to recognize that. Richard Foster, um, author, prolific author on, on all sorts of spiritual disciplines books, he, he wrote an article about forgiveness. And he talks about four things that forgiveness is not. And uh, for those of you that maybe wrestle with this deep hurt, I want you to hear these today especially. And, uh, and I'm just stealing straight from him right now. Like, this is not stuff that, that I came up with. Um, but he says this, four things that forgiveness is not. First thing is pretending it doesn't matter. Right? We, we say, oh, that's all right. Like, it really didn't hurt me in any way. Right? That's not forgiveness. That's lying. <laughs> right? I mean, that we, think that we think that we need to be holy and say, yeah, that's all right. That didn't really, that didn't really hurt. No, you're just lying. You're lying to them and you're lying to yourself. Right? Forgiveness isn't pretending that it doesn't matter. Right? The truth is that these things matter a great deal. And it does not help to avoid the issue when we've been deeply wounded. That's the first thing that forgiveness is not. Second one is forgiveness is not ceasing to hurt. Some think that if, if they continue to hurt, that somehow they haven't forgiven, right? And, and this is just not true. Like hurting is not evil. Right? If you hurt because of something, it's, you're not a bad person. Right? Forgiveness isn't ceasing to hurt. You may hurt for a very long time to come. You may hurt for the rest of your life. Right? Forgiveness does not mean that you will stop hurting. It's simply cutting the source of power to that hurt. Right? It's simply removing, removing that cord that ties you to allow that hurt to continue to be fed by the person that hurt you. Right? Forgiveness is not ceasing to hurt. Forgiveness is also not forgetting. Right? Anybody heard forgive and forget? Right? Yeah, all of us at some point, those of you online, right? Some of the, some of the dumb things that Christians say sometimes. Um, somebody could write a whole book on dumb things Christians say, right? That we think are there, right? Forgiveness does not mean forgetting, right? Many, many would make us to believe that in order to forgive, we must forget. But this just isn't the case, right? You'll remember, right? The difference will be that you no longer need or desire to use that offense against the offender. It's not that I forget. It's that I choose with God's help to no longer use that offense against the offender. I I, I remove the power from that thing. The memory remains, but the vindictiveness leaves. The memory's not going to go away, right? But the desire to make them pay no longer controls my thoughts and feelings about them. Right? That desire for you have to repay me, that, that by God's help goes away. Right? The memory remains. But God heals that vindictive spirit in us. And so forgiveness is not forgetting. And the fourth thing is this. Forgiveness does not mean the restoration of the relationship. See, in in some extreme cases, like I'm talking about abuse and and things like that, this isn't possible or even wise. That that if, if you've got a counselor or somebody that's saying that you need to repair this relationship and it's a relationship of abuse where abuse occurred, that is not a wise decision. In other cases... Right? This is the miracle of God's grace flowing through us. That restoration and reconciliation can happen. That more often than not, this is possible. Right? But in some cases, you need to know that it's just not wise for that restoration of that relationship. So those are the four things that, that forgiveness is not. And I love what Paul says in Romans. He says, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, that you you move towards that, but sometimes that other person isn't willing to move. That's okay, as far as it depends on you, right? You can still move towards that. You can still offer forgiveness, right? This is the way of the kingdom. Truth number three, freedom is found in forgiveness. N.T. Wright, he says this, as we learn what it is like to be forgiven, we begin to discover that it is possible and indeed joyful to forgive others. See, God's grace to you is not without effect. God's grace isn't impotent, right? God's grace has power in your lives. On your own, you're not strong enough to forgive in such a way that it actually sets you free. That's something that only God's grace can do. It's the power of the cross. When we cooperate with God, right, and forgiveness, that all of a sudden that grace is activated. When we allow forgiveness, that flood of God's grace and that flood of God's mercy extended to us, when we allow that to flow through our lives, it activates radical and effective forgiveness in us. This is the power of grace. The kingdom of God is like 
a person who was deeply wounded yet by God's grace was able to truly forgive and doing so find freedom. Right? They're no longer slaves to that offense. Why? Because Christ, listen to this, Christ has paid the debt of their offender. This is what God does. That person hurt me deeply. Guess what? Christ has paid the debt for that offender. And in doing that, he's paid the debt in your life. The thing that they took, he's covered by his blood. This is the good news of the cross that Jesus takes the, the sin of the world upon himself, that he takes on the debt of the world, that any hurt that you experience has been covered by the blood. Therefore, we can forgive. So forgiven people forgive people. And this is the whole point, right? This is the whole troubling parable of Matthew 18. This is the unsettling commentary of, of Matthew 6 that we read. Like forgiven people forgive people. Set free people set free people. Right? If you take nothing else from today, you need to understand that, that when you, if you've been forgiven, you've got the power to forgive. In fact, when you forgive, it activates forgiveness that you've received. Right? And not only that, it, it like, it's, I don't know math, but like exponentially activates, right? Whatever that means in, in your life. Paul, again, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So how do we stand firm? How do, how do we stand firm then? Well, forgiven people forgive people because they've discovered the only way to freedom, the only way to healing is through love. The experience of Christ's love in our hearts and the expression of Christ's love through our lives. The experience of Christ's love in our hearts and the expression of Christ's love through our lives. Paul says this in Romans 10, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Like, let, let no debt right, remain outstanding. If I hurt you, I've got to fix that. Because the only debt that I can leave outstanding is the, the debt that I've got to love you more and more. Let no debt remain outstanding. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there is may be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Peter, the apostle, he says this, right? The one who asked, how many times do I need to forgive? He says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply. Say this with me, because what? Love covers a multitude of sins. Love, not unforgiveness, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. Truth number four, the more you grow in love, the more quickly you forgive. The more you grow to become like Christ, the more quickly you are to forgive. As you become mature in Christ Jesus, guess what happens? You stop being so easily offended. When you grow to become like Christ, you're not offended by every little thing that somebody says to you. You're not offended by every little thing that somebody does to you. Right? You're not offended by, by the culture around you. That As you grow in love, you stop being so easily offended and you start being less offensive. Right? Because you grow to become like Christ. You're able to absorb an offense because Christ's life is being formed in you. And just like the king in the parable, you're willing to incur the debt of others because that's what Christ on the cross has done for you. And so Paul again writes this, and you know this verse in 1 Corinthians because we talk about it in weddings, but it's actually for every day. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angry. Here it is. It keeps no record of wrongs. The more you grow in love, the more quickly you forgive. And so we pray, forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. So I asked you to hold that situation. And I asked you to hold that person. You still got it? Still, still holding it? See, to be able to receive, we must first let go. So I asked Caleb's going to help me, help me out here for a minute. Um, so often we, we live our lives, right, with that thing that we just haven't asked forgiveness for and that person that, that hurt us deeply. And, and we, want, we, want to be, we want to be set free. Right? And we, we, want, we want to have freedom and we want to grow in, in love. But to, to receive, we must first let go. So Caleb, come on over here. And so Caleb, he's, he's carrying a lot. So he's carrying a lot of hurt, right? And, and things that he's done to, to people. And he's also, he's also carrying the stuff that people have done to him. 
And Caleb desperately wants freedom. He desperately wants to to walk in Christ. And he knows, he's been to church. He knows that God's grace is abundant. In fact, he knows the scripture from John 1, 16, that, that says this, says from his fullness, from Christ's fullness, right? We have all received grace, right? So Caleb, we've all received grace. Come on over. So I'm, you're receiving grace today. There you go. I know this metaphor is not, I, I wanted to use coffee beans because, you know. How much grace did you receive there? Uh, not a lot. Not a lot? Not, not much. Okay. But fortunately for you, that out of Christ's fullness, you've received grace upon grace. Oh. Here's some more. Oh, yeah. Brandy, don't get excited when you come back. There's lots of candy here. Hey, you got some grace. Awesome. Hey, you know what, Caleb, that um, I want to talk to you about something that maybe you said that hurt me. And I, I want, could, can you share, could you forgive me? Could you share some grace with, with me? What, what just happened? He's got no grace to give. Why? Right? He's holding unforgiveness. He's holding that hurt. Thank you, kid. You can have a seat. And this is what we do. We wonder. We wonder why we don't receive God's grace. We wonder why it's not activated in our lives because too often than not, we hold on to these things and forgiveness does not flow through us. Yes, you're forgiven. Right? Yes, God loves you. Right? But his love is not activated in you. His grace is not activated in you because you're holding on to things that he needs you to let go of. For forgiveness to work, it's got to flow through you. And the only way that we do that is to open our hands up and let it go. I love what Lisa Turker says here. She says, hurt feelings don't want to cooperate with holy instructions. Right? My feelings are hurt, God. I'm not letting go of that thing. They owe me. Hurt feelings don't want to cooperate with holy instructions. We have holy instructions. Do you want to be free? Do you, want, do, you, do you really? We all need to be set free. Remember, we're all debtors. We all need to be forgiven and we all need to forgive. And I encouragement to you would be open up those hands so that you can receive grace upon grace in your life. And guess what? When your hands are open, right, you get to hold it. And what happens when you hold it? You're able to give it. This is what, this is what grace does. So I'd invite you this morning and our band's going to come and, and close us and we're, we're running on time but I want them to sing this song here in a minute. See, the kingdom of God is the life of freedom and you're invited to it. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 34 verse 8. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we only, we only get to taste and see when we follow his instruction. Forgive me of my debt as I forgive others because that's the only way it's activated in me. That's the only way healing happens in me. So I want to invite you this morning as we close to open your hands. I don't know what that thing is. I don't know what it is. And maybe you, maybe you actually need to do this right there in your seat or those of you at home. Maybe you actually need to open up your hands and simply say, God, I need you to forgive me of my debts as I forgive my debtors. And lay it at the foot of the cross. The blood of Christ is strong enough. The blood of Christ will bring healing in your life. Grace upon grace will set you free to experience love and express love in ways that you were never able to before. And praying the Lord's Prayer every day is opening our hands to experience that freedom. This is why we pray it every day. I don't know about you, but I need to pray every day, God, forgive me my debt as I forgive my debtors. Because I want to I I hold it tight sometimes because that hurt. But God, I need, a, I need that freedom and I only get that freedom by reminding myself that it only comes from you. So I pray that every day. And I let that go. And for some of you today, maybe you've been hurt so deeply that it literally is every day. God, I'm coming to you like this this morning and I'm going like this. At 9 noon and 6 p.m. even, right? Like every time, oh, open my hands. Open my hands. It's the only way that grace is activated in me. Would you pray with me, God? We trust your word. 
And we so desperately want freedom in our lives. We so desperately want grace to be activated in our lives. And and we're so thankful that your word tells us that out of your fullness, you've given us grace upon grace. So teach us to open our hands. God, I pray for healing for those that are in the room and online that have been hurt deeply. And that debt can't be repaid by any person in this world. But God, your death and resurrection on the cross has filled that gap. You've taken care of the debt of our offender. Therefore, we have freedom in the way of the kingdom of God in this world is freedom. God, help us not to hold on to unforgiveness and and live a life of hell. God, you've called us to life. Would you give us courage to step into it? We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to invite you 9, noon, and 6. Join that prayer time. And a couple things. We didn't cover a whole lot of things that we could have covered. There's a great article I printed for you. It's out at the Get Connected desk by Timothy Keller. Um, Serving each other through forgiveness and reconciliation. If you want more steps on like what it looks like to actually forgive, great read. Um, Grab it. I printed nine or ten copies out there as well. And then a book. So Lisa Turkhurst, I used a quote um, here, wrote a book called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Um, super good. All right, she's got a, a whole section on uh, journeying through what the Bible actually says about forgiveness. That's just super good. I've got two copies. For those of you online, um, hit that connect card. You can see the link and the number right there, right? And I'll, I'll get one to you. For somebody in the house, it's just going to be right here. Um, if you need this book, come get it, right? If it's already gone, come talk to me, right? Because this is the way we experience freedom. And I encourage you to grab either one of those. And then finally, remember this. You can only fail at pray when you don't pray. You can only fail at prayer when you don't pray. So the band's going to close us in a song, and it's time to go. And again, say thank you to our, our family ministry team members. And, uh, but they're going to recap, um, this is amazing grace, because it is amazing. And it can be activated in your life through forgiveness. So I'm going to invite you to stand, and then band, would you close us in that song? <laughs>